Let me get started here and uh, ask the Lord to bless our evening here. Father, thank you for this uh, evening. Thank you for this uh, church. Thank you for um, creation. We thank you for uh, building the beautiful world that we can marvel. Even though it's in a fallen state, Father, we, we just admire the magnificence and beauty of your creation. Help us tonight as we look into a, an interesting subject that uh, uh, will uh, either build up our faith or if we uh, interpret it like the world does, could challenge our faith, Father. We just ask your guidance and protection and wisdom uh, upon us now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we, uh, two weeks ago we were looking at, at the age of the earth and we looked at some uh, periodic clocks like the salt to the sea and the mud on the seafloor and the decaying magnetic field to kind of figure out uh, if these things could be indicators of a young earth. And indeed we found out that they that they were, that 90% of the clocks that go on in the earth indicate a universe that's in an earth that's much younger than, uh, than what the evolutionist would require uh, for their theory. Um, but there was a couple of big ones that we left off that list. And one of them is this radiometric dating thing. And uh, everybody says, what about carbon-14 dating? Doesn't it prove the earth is billions of years old? Well, you know, carbon-14 dating can't do that. Uh, carbon-14 can only date something to a maximum of about 50,000 years. And so we'll see that carbon-14 uh, is, is, is going to turn out to be our friend. That's going to be the bottom line uh, on carbon-14. But we'll, uh, we'll get into, to, we'll spend a lot of time on carbon-14 uh, tonight. Um, but we'll also spend some time on dating rocks. I mean, there's other methods besides carbon-14 dating that do, in fact, come up with answers in the billions of years. Uh, the uranium uh, to lead decay method for radioisotope dating and rubidium strontium method, the uh, potassium argon method used to date volcanic uh, basalts and uh, lava flows. But carbon-14 is the famous one that uh, a lot of people, it was discovered in 1950 or thereabouts, 1949 by Willard Libby. Uh, and so we'll look in, in how that works tonight because until we really discover the, the details of, of what's going on with that, uh, you really won't get, gain an appreciation for how carbon-14 dating really turns out to be in our favor if you look at the, uh, at the data right. Um, but before we go uh, further with that, let me give you a little picture of a, sorry, hang on one second. Let me ask you this question. How long has this candle been burning? Imagine I've had a candle sitting up here and uh, it's burning and, and so I asked the question, how long has it been burning? And so what would we do to determine how long this candle has been burning? Well, first thing we might do is we might uh, mark where it is right now and then observe it for a while, right? Just see, kind of see how fast it, it burns. And so we'll watch it burn down over the next hour and we'll measure it, it's an inch. And so we say, okay, well this candle burns at the rate of one inch an hour, okay? Now, do, do I have enough information to figure out how long this candle has been burning? What else do I need to know? Yeah, how, how, what, what's the length of it to begin with? So not only do I have to know the rate of burn, but I gotta know the initial amount so that I can see how long it's been been burning. And this kind of gives you the fundamentals of, uh, of uh, uh, radiometric dating here. If I assume this candle was this long to begin with, and I measured that this distance was two inches, of course that's a big assumption, right? It could have been much longer, but a 12 inch candle or something like that might be a standard, and so I could make that assumption. So if it's been burning for a total of two inches during that period of time and one inch here, always at the rate of one inch an hour, how long has it been burning? Yeah, three, exactly, you got it. I mean, you, this is, makes sense. And that's the kind of math that they expect you to do when you do carbon-14 dating and all these other datings. It, it's, it's really as simple as that. But how about my assumptions? Are they correct? Okay. Uh, am I safe in determining this? Could, could there be other factors that have gone on in this thing? What, what could have influenced and given me a wrong answer? Yeah, yeah, the wind could have made that candle kind of burn a little brighter or whatever and uh, cause it to burn the, the fuel or the wax a little faster. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, 
oxygen in the room can cause it to build to burn faster or whatever or, or uh, exactly initial length yeah I could be wrong about that I assume 12 inches it could have been 13 or you know it could have been a used candle and 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 it started that at a different height anybody else have an idea why I would not be wrong about that what, what if it was a tapered candle <laughs> Yeah, I've got much less wax to burn right there. And so uh, it would take less time to burn that first part off right there. And so there's all kinds of reasons that I could have been wrong, and it's all based on the assumptions, right? And, and unless somebody was there to observe this candle to begin with, you know, we wouldn't be sure about any of that. And so uh, the principle of, of any kind of dating with this, this method is how much did I have to begin with and how fast is it burning right now? And we've got to be right about both those things. And so this gives us a clue about what might be wrong with the carbon-14 dating. Now, so how does carbon-14 dating work? Well, when I say carbon-14, that's not a normal carbon. That's a radioactive carbon. Normally, most of the carbon you see in the world is carbon-12. Uh, I'll explain to you what the 12 means and, and, and so forth in just a minute here. But there's all kinds of carbon out there. There's carbon-9, there's carbon-10, there's carbon-11. There's a carbon-13 even, and, and then, of course, carbon-14, and most of it's carbon-12. But before we look into how carbon-14 works, we need to kind of review or delve into the basic elements, atoms. What's, what's an atom? And uh, this is a picture of a hydrogen atom. Now, just, to, just so you'll know about the scale of this atom, the size of the proton to the size of the electron and so forth, if... If I had a proton in my hand right here that was the size of a pinhead, okay? That'd be a big proton, okay? Because protons are usually much smaller than that. But if I had one here and it was the size of a pinhead, how far away would that electron be? Three feet? Huh? Well, you, you jumped quite a bit. Um, the size of a pinhead, it wouldn't be that wall. It wouldn't be uh, the edge of the church out there where the gym is, it would be out there about where the expressway is. That's about how far, and so it wouldn't be California. That, you went way far, but uh, uh, that gives you an idea of all the empty space between the nucleus of the atom and the electron out there in this furthest orbit out there. Is this vast distance out there uh, of empty space uh, between the protons. So most, I mean, this table is mostly nothing, okay? You only feel it because of the electromagnetic uh, operations of electrons bumping up against other electrons and, and so forth. Amazing. Uh, that really doesn't have anything to do with carbon-14 dating, though. So let's, let, let, that's just a, kind of an aside. Uh, but notice that this proton, I mean, this uh, hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. That's about the, when I'm about, that is the simplest element uh, of all the elements. Matter of fact, 90% of the matter in the universe is made up of hydrogen atoms. What is the sun made of? Mostly hydrogen. Matter of fact, hydrogen burns really well. It's a very volatile gas that, uh, that when ignited, it'll burn. Remember the, uh, the, the Zeppelin, the, 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 the blimp that they filled up with hydrogen gas that blew up, had a spark, and it, and it blew up because but hydrogen is lighter than air. It's kind of like helium, uh, but it's very volatile. And so uh, that's what burns. That's what the sun does and everything. And you have nuclear fusion going on. It gets so hot in there. That, that scientists also say that most of the, well, not, that the result of the Big Bang, you can take that with a grain of salt, the result of the Big Bang was all hydrogen atoms, that, that the initial matter in the universe was only hydrogen atoms, that the only way you got the other elements, the heavier elements, is through stellar evolution where a star would go through its life cycle and then finally explode in a supernova, create heavier elements as a result of that super, supernova. So in order to get the, the rest of the elements that we see in the world today, uh, that makes up planets and so forth, you have to have that uh, initial stellar evolution right there. But So that's the hydrogen atom. And if it's got one proton, that means its atomic number is one. And if it's got more than one particle this size, neutrons and so forth, that would be its atomic weight, but it's only got one. So both the atomic number and the atomic weight of a hydrogen atom is one. Now, I know to say an energy level or cloud, but it's easier just to say orbit. That's the way the electron flows around there, but, but, but I know better than that, but uh, it's just easier for me to speak like that. So it should be energy level or cloud, 
because you don't know where the electron is at any point in time. It could be anywhere within a sphere, but you can't measure the, the distance of that electron at any point in time. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So here is a helium atom. That's the next element in the periodic table. And a helium atom is, is considerably bigger than a hydrogen atom. It's got four particles in the nucleus, two protons and two neutrons. A proton's got a positive charge, right? You know about that? And a, an electron's got a negative charge. And so typically, you need to balance out the number of positive charges, two protons with two electrons. And so they, they cancel each other out, and you have a net, net zero charge in this atom. Atoms are happy when they have a net zero charge. Um, but because there's four particles in the nucleus, that gives it an atomic weight of four. And the atomic number is two because that's counting the number of protons only. So atomic number is how many protons it has. And the atomic number is what tells you what kind of element it is. Um, if it's got two protons, it's always a helium atom, whether or not we had the neutrons to go along with it or not. Two protons means helium, one proton means hydrogen, and so forth. And we'll see that some more. So, um, and because, uh, well, we'll get into that later. But uh, helium, by the way, is a non-reactive gas. It's one of the noble gases. It doesn't react with anything uh, because it's got a full valence of outer orbit electrons, and it won't combine with any other uh, atoms at all. So it's a non-reactive uh, gas like that. That's why it's safe to have helium balloons as opposed to uh, hydrogen balloons. Okay, carbon is, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of, bunch of them, about uh, 10 of them, and we'll jump all the way to carbon because that's carbon-14. That's how we get the carbon-14 from. But typically, uh, most of the carbon in the universe is carbon-12. That means it's got six protons and six neutrons. Six plus six equal 12. That's its atomic weight. Its atomic number is six. And that, by definition, if it's got an atomic number of six, it's carbon. And uh, so how many electrons do we need then? We need six electrons to balance that charge out. And two of them go in the inner orbit, and that fills up the inner orbit. And then um, all the rest of the orbits on any atom want to have a full orbit of eight electrons. And so eight electrons is typically the valence or the, or the filling of the orbit. And so it's only got four. So carbon is a very reactive type of atom. It, it, that's why things are made out of carbon plus something else, carbon dioxide and so forth, and, and you'll see uh, how all that works. As a matter of fact, uh, this would be a carbon atom with the four outside electrons, and then an oxygen has six outside electrons, so it's too short of becoming full. And here's another oxygen has six outside electrons, so it's too short of becoming full. So what they do is they share electrons. The carbon shares two electrons, I mean two electrons with this oxygen atom and two electrons with this oxygen atom. They both end up, or they all end up with eight total electrons because if you take the ones that are shared, six plus the extra two makes eight, four plus the extra four in this case makes eight for the carbon, and then again six plus the extra two makes eight for here. So they're happy, that's, that's chemistry. That's why things bond together. That's what makes, them, makes chemistry work. That's why they, they, they uh, uh, like to be together like that. And so. Uh, all of life, by the way, is carbon-based. You've heard about carbon-based life. Well, all life is carbon-based. Without carbon, you, there would be no uh, life. And so uh, carbon is critical for uh, life. OK, um, so back to the, uh, to the carbon atom, the blown-up picture of the carbon atom right here. Uh, also, you know, I said atoms are happy when they have the same number of protons as they do electrons, as they give them a balanced charge a net charge of zero, they're also happy when they have nearly the same number of protons as they do neutrons, okay? Atoms like to have, in this case, six protons and six neutrons. He's happy when that happens. If he gets extra neutrons or extra protons, you know, out of balance like that, he's unhappy. And when an, un an atom's unhappy, he becomes radioactive. That's what, uh, uh, that's what makes him uh, unhappy like that. So we're going to find how that works here in just a minute. So how do you get carbon-14? What's the magic of getting carbon-14? Well, here is a nitrogen atom. Now, that's the last atom I want to show you. I promise you. I'm not going to go all the way down the point. So we're a little here. But a nitrogen atom has an atomic number of seven, so seven protons. And seven neutrons makes 14 is the atomic weight. 
he's got exactly the same number of protons as he does neutrons, and so he's happy, right? And uh, he's not radioactive, but the atmosphere you breathe, matter of fact, the air we're breathing right now is 78% nitrogen. So most of what you're breathing is nitrogen. It has a little bit of, I mean, what, 12% oxygen and some other stuff, but uh, not that much oxygen in the air you breathe compared to nitrogen. So most of what you're breathing is nitrogen. And um, it goes all the way up. I mean, all the way up to the upper reaches of the atmosphere, you find nitrogen up there. And the Earth is constantly being bombarded by cosmic rays, okay? Cosmic rays come from the sun and from supernova explosions and other galaxies and so forth that hit this Earth. What a cosmic ray is is simply a very high-speed proton, okay? Sometimes they're alpha particles and electrons and so forth, neutrinos and so forth, but most of the cosmic ray bombardment that, uh, that the Earth receives is, is just high, protons moving at nearly the speed of light. That is a very high energy particle. And most of them are coming from the sun that hit our Earth now. Matter of fact, when, when I say they hit our Earth, they're hitting our upper atmosphere, those nitrogen atoms. They're not hitting the, the Earth. Uh, you're not getting hardly any on you. Our atmosphere does a great job of protecting you from cosmic ray. Uh, bombardment, as does the magnetic field. We talked about that uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, but cosmic ray bombardment, what happens is that a high-speed proton will hit the molecules of the upper atmosphere, kind of like billiards, and it, since it's so energized, it, it's really a basic a little tiny explosion that just, because it just blows that molecule to smithereen. And, nu and neutrons then fly out as kind of a secondary particle. So it hits a neutron, so now we got a neutron flying into the picture here. And uh, what I want you to see then is this neutron hits the proton, boom, and it knocks the proton out. And so a neutron came from outer space and, and, and knocked the proton out, okay? So now how many protons does this nitrogen atom have? What's changed? Okay, he's got six now. And so the atomic number is no longer seven, which would have been a nitrogen atom, Atomic number is now six. What does that make it? Carbon, it's got to be carbon. Now how many particles does it have? Basically I swapped out a proton for a neutron, so I have exactly the same number of particles, so it's the same thing as nitrogen 14 or carbon 14. And so this is the production of carbon 14 in our air that we breathe. And so uh, carbon 14 is constantly being refreshed or reproduced Radioactive carbon-14 is constantly being reproduced in the atmosphere right now because of cosmic ray bombardment, and that's what, what goes on. Now, this is called an isotope. Remember I said most of the carbon is carbon-12? Carbon-14 is an odd thing. It's, it's a rare thing, and they call it an isotope. That means it's got a different atomic, a different atomic weight than, than what's typical. But he's unstable and radioactive, and eventually this thing's going to decay in what we call radiation right here, and we'll take a look at how that works in just a minute. Now, here are the different types of radiation, okay? And, and it's not as complicated as, as, as you would think. There's only three different types. There is beta decay, which is a very weak form of radiation, and that's what carbon-14 does. It, has a, it loses an electron, so when an electron jumps off that, uh, that neutron. By the way, you can think, this is kind of an interesting way of thinking, you can think of a neutron as being the same thing as a proton with an electron stuck inside of it. Okay, electron doesn't weigh hardly anything, so they both weigh one. I'm not sure electron weighs anything at all, but uh, uh, so a neutron basically is the same thing as a proton with an electron embedded in it. Okay, and because it's got a proton and an electron all there together, it's got a neutral charge, and so the uh, Neutron, neutron is neutral, it doesn't have a charge, it just adds weight to the atom. And so a beta decay means the neutron loses, this proton uh, loses, uh, uh, I mean, the, the neutron loses the, the electron, turning it back into a proton, okay? And so when we lose an electron, that's beta decay, uh, and the next type of radiation is called alpha decay. Now that's a very strong form of radiation because it's an alpha particle. An alpha particle, remember the helium atom you saw? Well, the center of that helium particle is called an alpha particle. The nucleus is called an alpha particle without the electrons. So you take away the electrons from the helium and you got an alpha particle. Two protons, two neutrons is an alpha particle. And uh, 
it's very heavy. The reason that the alpha decay is so strong is because it's so heavy compared to just a tiny little electron. Uh, electrons are a very weak form of radiation, beta decay that is. Alpha decay is a very strong form of radiation, not because it's a high energy particle, like that proton flying in from outer space at the speed of light and so forth, but because it's so heavy. It's like cannonballs versus BBs, okay? A cannonball, it doesn't move very fast, but when it hits you, you know it, okay? Um, and so it can do a lot of damage because of its weight. The, there's only one other type of radiation. It's called gamma rays or X-rays. Uh, gamma rays and X-rays would be basically the same type of radiation. That's the strongest form of radiation. And uh, it's, it's, a gamma ray is basically a photon of light. It's, you know, again, a photon is kind of like an electron in terms of particle size and so forth. But a photon is uh, uh, visible light. Where the photons are striking your eyes right now as you observe everything. Uh, but they're not very energetic photons. The, uh, the higher the frequency, the more energetic the photon. So a gamma ray will be very high frequency uh, wavelengths uh, in that light. And so uh, they can even do surgery with gamma rays. You, know, you can do what they call them gamma knife surgery. And so you can cut away things with, with a gamma ray and so forth. And of course, you can take x-rays and things like that with the, with the gamma rays as well. So that's the strongest form of radiation. But neither one of these have anything to do with carbon-14. Now, alpha decay is going to play a big role in uranium to, and rubidium strontium and so forth, those types of uh, radiometric dating, those alpha decay is the, is the most important part of that. But the carbon-14 is a very weak beta decay, and that's actually good news, as you'll see in just a minute, because, uh, so, uh, let's show what happens on the carbon-14 decay. Remember I said the neutron was equal to, was the same thing as a proton with an electron better than it? Watch this neutron right here, okay? Because the, the, when it decays, it does this. Boom, the electron pops out, and now we got the proton instead, and that's beta decay. And so now what's happened? What's changed about this atom now? It was carbon-14, now what is it? The atomic number has changed from six to seven. Okay, that makes it what? Nitrogen, right, so it goes back to nitrogen. So the atomic weight stays the same at 14, and so that's what beta decay is. And uh, you'll see that uh, uh, there's a chance that this is gonna occur a 50-50 chance that any carbon-14 atom is going to decay over the next 5,730 years. Don't ask me how they know that. <laughs> but uh, if you want to go down to Tunica and bet on that, they, they'll be glad to take your bet <laughs> on a carbon-14 atom right there. But we don't bet, do we? So um, that's the, uh, uh, the atomic number is now seven back to carbon-14. Now, uh, the ratio in uh, of uh, the carbon-14 slash carbon-12 ratio in the biosphere is what's important about carbon-14 dating. Because remember I said carbon-14 is always being produced by the cosmic rays in the upper level atmosphere at all time. Well, what do you breathe? Air, right? So, and what do you eat? Plants. And what do plants breathe? They take in air too, but they take in carbon dioxide, right? They take in, and we breathe out carbon dioxide, right? And so that's this symbiotic relationship between animals and plants. Uh, you learned all that in school. And so uh, plant matter is always taking in new carbon, carbon dioxide, and some of that carbon dioxide is going to be carbon-14. As a matter of fact, one out of every, well, we'll do, we'll do it, we'll figure it right here. Um, they estimate that there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 trillion tons of carbon in the biosphere, in all plant matter, atmosphere, molecules of the air, and so forth. That's the amount of carbon-12 in our world right now, 75 trillion tons. And that sounds like a lot, but it's spread out over the whole thing. And they estimate that there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 62 tons of carbon-14. Now that's a ratio of about one to 1.2 trillion. So typically, so you can see carbon-14 is not a real popular atom right there. Uh, it only exists one out of about a trillion. Okay, so one about every trillion uh, carbon atoms is radioactive right there. Now, where is all this carbon-14 now? Well, it, it's in you and me, okay? You got car 
What you ate for lunch today was radioactive. And so therefore, as you digest it, you are radioactive. Now, don't worry about it because it's so little and the, the, the decay, beta decay is so weak, it's, it's not doing much damage to you right there. Uh, but uh, because we eat plant matter and plant matter takes in carbon-14 and so forth, matter of fact, all plants, the way they grow is not from sucking dirt up out of the soil. I always thought it was dirt, you know, like the dirt becomes a plant, right? No. The dirt just simply provides the water and the, car, car, the photosynthesis process of the sunlight hitting the leaves and so forth and the plant breathes in carbon dioxide, the carbon in that carbon dioxide becomes the matter for the plant life. And so it takes air and turns it into uh, stalks and leaves and all that kind of stuff. I didn't know that, but that's, that's the way it works. And uh, that's where all the carbon fr comes from. So plants become saturated with about 1 to 1 1.2 trillion carbon-14. We eat the plants. We become saturated with about 1 to 1.2 trillion uh, carbon-14 atoms per carbon-12 atoms. Uh, so uh, that's where it all goes. Now, um, same percentage in the entire biosphere. Now, the biosphere includes everything from about 18 inches below the level of the soil up to the upper reaches of the atmosphere. That's the biosphere. Um, so about one out of every trillion carbon atoms in your body is radioactive. Uh, what happens when you die? You're gonna eat lunch after you die? No, you're not gonna eat anything more. And so when you stop eating, when you die, you stop taking in new carbon-14. And what happens to the carbon-14 that was in your body when you died? Well, in 5,700 years, half of it's going to be gone. And then, so as you, as your body decays and as that bone, you know, sits there in the grave and so forth for all that many time, the carbon-14, after so many years, is going to be all depleted out because of the decay. And since you're not eating anything after you die, uh, you, there's no way to replenish that. So you, you, you get out of the cycle of, of producing all that carbon-14 in your body. Now, how does this work then? What, how do they know how old something is? This is what we call a half-life table. Willard Libby, Willard Libby in 1940-some-odd figured all this out about carbon-14 dating to give him credit. Um, but basically, if you start out with 100 units or pounds or 100 atoms or 100 whatever, a pile, let's say a pile of carbon-14 atoms, how much are you going to have left at the end of 5,730 years? half of it, okay? So you'll have 50 pounds left, and then after another 5,730 years, a quarter of it's gonna be left, then an eighth, a sixteenth, and so as you can see that I'm dropping pretty quickly, and then as I get further out in time, at about 50,000 years, it's so little that it's insignificant, okay? So that's why when you get out this far, you really can't date anything beyond that because you don't expect to find any carbon-14 in something that's been dead that long anyway. So carbon-14 is used to date only once living matter, once living life, okay? It's not used to date rocks at all. Uh, just uh, bones and uh, fossiliferous type tissues. Um, well, not even fossils, just basically once living matter is all that you can date with carbon-14, a piece of wood or whatever. You could date with carbon-14, so that's it. So if we have, uh, if we find something uh, if we find a, a piece of wood or whatever, it has a ratio of one to 10 trillion, not one to a trillion. Remember, typically it's one to a trillion. If we find something with one to 10 trillion, how old is it? How, when did it die? How long ago did it die? Well, you can use this chart, okay? One to 10 would be about a one-tenth ratio. So here is one-eighth and here is one-sixteenth. So one-tenth is gonna be somewhere between those two right there. And uh, so we draw a line where the one-tenth meets and so there's the 10% right there, there's one tenth, we drop a vertical line, and so we look at what the uh, age would be at this point. So somewhere in the neighborhood of, say, 20,000 years old. So if it's got a tenth, instead of a, it's a if, it's, if it's got a tenth what it used to have, the one to one trillion, basically it's got one to 10 trillion uh, uh, carbon 14 atoms per carbon 12 atoms, then it's about 20,000 years old. That's how that chart works. Okay, now, there's an assumption that's made about this, though, about the initial amount. They assume that we're at equilibrium. Now, what do I mean by equilibrium, okay? 
they assume that, that the amount of carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio has been the same over the last at least 50,000 years, because that's as old as they can do it. And so uh, how do we know that that uh, is the case? Well, or what is equilibrium? Well, so th th this is a barrel of water, okay? I'm, I've got a garden hose dumping into this 55-gallon uh, drum here, and I've got some holes drilled in the side right here. So as that water is filling up that drum, the water is going to spill out those holes, and as the water level gets higher and higher, this bottom hole is going to get more pressure and less pressure and so forth. And so that's basically what it's going to look like as the water trickles out of that barrel. Now, assuming that I've drilled the right number of holes and all that kind of stuff, I've got it situated where I put that garden hose, and that barrel is never going to fill up because it's flowing out at the same level, at the same rate that I'm filling up. So I got water going in, I got water going out. Eventually, they will equalize, and so that water level is going to be somewhere about this height up here, and that'll be equilibrium. The water level will stop rising at that point and and, and basically equalize out. And so that's what equilibrium is. That kind of gives you a picture of how uh, they figure that the equilibrium works because you've got new carbon-14 being produced every day, all the time, and you've got carbon-14 being taken out all the time as well. And so uh, what's the uh, what's the half-life right there? It's, it's the way it's being taken out is by decay, right? That's the way it's, it's being taken out. So. Here's uh, the deal. If you look at the math on this thing, and I, we could reproduce it, I, I did this math myself right here, but if you take um, about eight kilograms of carbon-14 produced by carbon, by, by cosmic rays in a given year, and that's about the production rate of carbon-14 in the upper level atmosphere right now. That's where you get the new carbon-14 from. That's the, that's the incoming rate. So you got eight kilograms coming in, but Remember I said 62 tons was the amount of carbon they estimate, carbon-14 they estimate right now? It decays at about one hundredth of one percent a year. 5,730 years being the half-life, you can actually back that in to figure out how much a year does it decay, about one hundredth of one percent a year. And so you do that math right there, that gives you seven kilograms per year decay rate. And so you've got a net gain of one kilogram a year. Which means, by the way, we're not at equilibrium right now, right? Because that means it's constantly growing. And so at that rate, uh, how long would this growth continue? Would this growth of one kilogram a year continue forever like that? No, because it's just like that 55-gallon drum I'm trying to fill up with water. Eventually, it's going to, to uh, end up equalizing out so that the point when I reach 75 tons, not 62 tons, but 75 tons, It'll be yielding eight kilograms a year, which is about what's being produced by the cosmic rays, and then we'll be at equilibrium. So we're not at equilibrium yet, okay? Um, and at that rate, you'd need uh, another 13 tons to go from 62 to 75 right there. And so uh, it would take 11,793 years to reach equilibrium at the rate uh, we're going right now. So that's an interesting uh, uh, conclusion right there. So something must have happened to the carbon-14 in the past, if the Earth is billions of years old, right? Well, let's take a look at what that might have been. If the number of cosmic rays uh, hitting the atmosphere were the same today as it was uh, back then, based on a 6,000-year age, we should be nowhere near the equilibrium, okay, because it takes at least 25,000 years to reach equilibrium, if, if all things being equal right here. And uh, in fact, it appears that we're closer than we should be given that, uh, th that fact. But um, there are other reasons to think that the amount of carbon-14 would be much less than today's value right here. Uh, what happened, by the way, about 4,500 years ago? The flood, right? And and that's the elephant in the living room nobody wants to talk about, right? I mean, we, every time we drive through a road cut, we see evidence of stuff like that. And so it was a huge cataclysmic event that happened. Could that have had an effect on the carbon-14? What would the effect of that have been? So here uh, is the carbon-14 before the flood. It must have been less than today's amount of carbon-14 because uh, the there were only 1,656 1, years between Adam and Noah, okay, when, when the ark went out, okay? 
And so that's not enough time to reach equilibrium. So there's a short time to produce all the carbon-14 if co cosmic rays were the method that were being produced back then, they're being used back then to produce carbon-14. So in that case, uh, you'd only have about one-third of today's amount, even if the cosmic rays were as high as they are now. Plus, the Earth magnetic field was much higher back then because remember I said it was decreasing? The Earth mag Earth's magnetic field tends to stop the cosmic rays as well, and so you'd have less production in the past because of a stronger magnetic field uh, of carbon-14 than you do today. So you play take those two, uh, uh, you heard of the canopy theory, maybe, maybe that had something to do with it as well, but uh, uh, all you really need is the magnetic shield and the, uh, the fact that we really didn't have enough time uh, to produce that. Okay. Um, Certainly there was a lower production rate uh, because of those two things. All right, uh, so both these things mean there was less pre-flood carbon-14, so what's the difference between the pre- and post-flood biosphere? The, the carbon-14 was less than today in the pre-flood biosphere and the carbon-12 was much greater than today. Can you guess why? It was a much lusher environment, right? I mean, you know, you had the uh, I mean, if there was a water vapor canopy or whatever, you probably had a greenhouse effect and you had stuff growing everywhere. Where did all that oil come from? All that stuff had to get buried, the plant matter and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, that plant matter has been taken out of the biosphere because it's all, well, we have to drill for oil, right? But that used to be plants up on the surface of the earth in the biosphere, actively engaged in the carbon uh, cycle and so forth. And so that would have produced, that would have been a whole lot more carbon-12 back then. So if the carbon-14 was less and the carbon-12 was greater, that gives you a chart that looks like this. Let's assume that it was a less than, than 11 tons, and we've got good reason to, to assume that. Remember I said 62 tons a day, so considerably less than that, about 11 tons pre-flood. Um, carbon-12, probably not 75 trillion tons, but about 10 times that much, 750 trillion tons. And so the ratio wouldn't be about one to one trillion. It'd be about, well, if this was oh, 0.83 trillion, it's now 0 0.015 trillion. So considerably uh, less. And so uh, that's going to have an effect. Now, what does that do? Um, the pre flood ratio was less than 2% of what it is today, if that's the case. And so here is a chart that's going to, or, or uh, a graph that's going to show us how to overestimate the age of a fossil, right? Because when they measure fossils with carbon-14, they come up with certain ages, and so this is how they do it right here. Um, you've got a timeline of once dead things with uh, carbon-14, and so if this is the assumed amount of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in the biosphere right here, I draw a line on this graph up here, and this is time all right, this is the, the beginning right here and going back to time. Creation starts 6,000 years ago, here's time. Okay, and here's where we are today. This is, we find a fossil and we find its ratio. It's much less than, than what it's supposed to be up here. So it must have been dead for a long time. How do we know how long it's been dead? Well, we just draw the, the chart, the, the curve back to the point where it crosses over here. And so it's going to be somewhere in this particular case for this one about 10,000 years old, which is older than what we want, all right? Now we don't, if we say it's only 6,000 years old, then that's a wrong answer right here. Okay, so how do you make that mistake, all right? A flood occurred about 4,500 years ago. So at the point of the flood, you had a much, remember, I just proved, or not proved, it's just suggested to you that the ratio was about considerably less back then. So here's the ratio pre-flood. Post-flood, the first thing that happens during the flood is you bury all that plant matter. So immediately you take out a lot of carbon-12, but you haven't done anything to the upper level atmosphere. So you get the same production rate of carbon-14. So you'll get a dramatic increase in ratio from carbon-14 to carbon-12 over that first 500 or so years, maybe during the ice age or whatever. Um, it'll just grow at an exponential rate because of the lack of carbon-12, and so much more carbon-14 produced at, the, at, the, at, the, at that rate, uh, or the same amount of carbon-14 produced, so it'll jump up in, in, in ratios fast. So now, here's the correct answer. We draw our, our curve again, that's where we cross, it comes down, and so the age of that fossil is about 4,000 years old, okay? 
and that would be the correct rate because you got to go to the line where the actual was, not where the assumed was over here. And so the actual is a curve as opposed to a straight line like that. And all because of the flood right there. So the flood is the reason that, uh, uh, that you come up with different answers. You can see how the flood would affect uh, this thing. So bottom line, carbon-14 is our friend uh, from a young earth dating uh, perspective. Now, is there any evidence that this is the case, okay? Is there any real life evidence? That was all theory, okay? Everything I just told you was theory. We, we did a little bit of math, we did a few numbers and so forth, uh, but I couldn't prove any of that. But uh, it turns out that uh, what, during the Ice Age, what were those big elephant-like things they found? The woolly mammoth. Remember those big hairy elephant-like creatures out there? Well, they found a whole woolly mammoth buried in the ice, and they did carbon-14 dating on this woolly mammoth, and they found that the ribs on this woolly mammoth dated to about 20,400 years. Okay, that's older than what we want, obviously, uh, but I just explained to you how you get the wrong answer because you're not considering the flood. And the leg bones on this mammoth dated to 17,500 years, about a 300-year uh, <coughs> difference between the two. So 3,000 year difference between the two. And so the leg bones appeared younger than the ribs. Same woolly mammoth, same critter, uh, but how do you get the, the, uh, such a discrepancy right there? Because if he died, I mean, his leg bones didn't continue to live, you know, 3,000 years after he, after he died, and so uh, he would have died all at the same time. So how do you explain that discrepancy? Well, let's see if our model fits that, okay? Um, different parts of your body are replaced at different speeds or different ratios, right? Because your leg bones wear out faster than your ribs, right? Because you're constantly walking on them and wearing them out and so forth. So the tissue buildup and repair and so forth has to occur at a faster rate in your legs because of the, the usage of those legs. So if the ratio is changing rapidly, remember the steep curve of the ratio changing rapidly? Well, the material in your leg bones would be at a little bit longer or at a much higher ratio out there making it appear as if it's younger, okay? So you, the discrepancy makes sense in that particular in that particular case. So the creation model and the data do support uh, this type of uh, conclusion right there. So the, the evolutionist or the, the scientist that doesn't believe in all this stuff can't explain this. He just has to assume it's anomaly, but it's supposed to be accurate right there. And is there some other data? Well, they found a lava flow and a you know, lava flow, turn, they call it basalt. That's the rock that's really comes out of the lava flow right there. And uh, they did potassium argon dating on this lava flow, and they said this volcano erupted 48 million years ago. So that was their date for this volcano right there. But it turns out they found a tree trunk embedded in this lava flow. The lava flowed, and then it you know, flowed over the top of this tree and basically encased this tree. And so this tree had to die either then or before the lava flow occurred, right? And so, uh, the tree died at about the same time that the volcano erupted, right? So they should date about the same. So how do you date once living matter? Carbon-14. But no one thought to date this tree because if it's 48 billion years, there wouldn't be any carbon-14 dating or carbon-14 left in that tree. Turns out they found carbon-14 in that tree and it dated to be uh, 38,000 years old, this tree. And so you've got one dating method that says the volcano erupted 40 eight million years ago, and you got another dating method that says it erupted 38,000 years ago. That's a whopping big difference and a discrepancy that, that no one can explain. Uh, and of course, again, how do you misdate a fossil? By not assuming the flood. And so if you figured it out correctly, it'd probably be about 5,000 years old, adjusting for our modified flood model in there. So proper carbon-14 methods must account for these differences, and that's why um, that's why uh, this model must be uh, changed to get it right. Now, rock dating. Now, I don't recommend that teenagers date rocks. They're not very good conversationalists and they never pick up the tab, but uh, that's not the kind of rock dating we're talking about. So, uh, we've explained carbon-14 dates, but what about these million-year dates, okay? How do they date rocks? You know, not once living matter, but rocks, granite and so forth. They actually attempt to date granite and things like that. Now, remember with the, the, the carbon-14, the problem was the initial amount. If you assume the amount of carbon-14 has been constant, then you're gonna make a mistake in your assumption right there. 
with, with dating rocks, it's not the initial amount because they don't take that into consideration the initial amount. They look at the amount of daughter elements because it goes from uranium to lead, rubidium to strontium, uh, potassium to argon. They look at the amount of daughter element, the lead, the potassium, the, the uh, argon, or the uh, strontium and so forth. That's what they use to measure the, the, the amount of daughter elements. And the rate of decay is the key element of the uh, for those because it's got a much longer half-life. Uh, these half-lives on these things are much longer uh, in the millions of years as opposed to the few thousand years. And they go through a much more complicated decay cycle as well. Uh, they have all the alpha decay and stuff going on at the same time. Now, there are different types of rocks. There are igneous rocks, and that's like granite, okay? That would be the basement rock or the creation rock or the initial rock. It's basically crystallized molten magma. That's what igneous rocks are. And then you've got the sedimentary rocks, and that's the rocks that are formed, you know, by uh, uh, laying down silt and so forth, and then it calcifies and solidifies and becomes a, uh, a rock. Um, and that's a sandstone would be a type of sedimentary rock. Um, and then you've got the metamorphic rock, which is basalts and so forth, and that's uh, lava flows. And, uh, uh, and so those are the three different types of rocks that we find in the world today. And uh, <coughs> this is a table of the, remember I told you the daughter elements were the important thing. So the potassium argon method, uh, you're looking at the daughter element and the half-life on this method is 1.25 billion years. Uh, half-life on rubidium strontium, 48.8 billion years, 4.47 billion years. And the uranium lead is about three quarters of a billion years down here. I don't know why my, my screen's going down here. But uh, that's the uh, uh, half-lives on these. So you can see it's much longer than just the 5,730 years of carbon-14. And notice how much, uh, so it turns out there's a lot of anomalies uh, with these dates that they come up with. Th this is a set of volcanoes. You've got the Sunset Crater, uh, over here in New Zealand, one in Hawaii, another one in uh, Sicily, the Mount Etna uh, the volcano in Sicily. Now, the potassium argon date for this sunset crater in northern Arizona comes out to about 200,000 plus years ago. But it erupted in, because people, uh, uh, there's historical records of this, it erupted in 1065 AD, okay? Uh, and so uh, that would only put it about a thousand years old when it, when it erupted. Uh, but yet the potassium argon gave an incorrect date of 200,000 years old like that. Cannot be. And then in this one in New Zealand, potassium argon, 275,000 years old, but it erupted in 1949 and 1954 and 1975. Now, unlike this one up here where they had to use some, some Indian you know, uh, tribal uh, pictures on, on cave walls and so forth. We were around uh, during these uh, events right here, but yet the potassium argon date dated it to 275,000 years old. And in Hawaii, this Hualaya basalt in Hawaii, the potassium argon about 1.4 to 22 million, and they said, uh, uh, but that actually erupted in 1801. So again, people were there and observed this eruption. And then finally, the one in Sicily, uh, another long age, hundreds of thousands of years, and yet it erupted in 1972. So um, they assume that the point at which it erupted is the point at which there was no argon, and so the potassium to argon decay method had to produce that daughter element of argon because since argon is a gas, it must have completely escaped when it was molten and, 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 and rock like that. So that's how they know when it, when, supposedly when it erupted. Now, interesting uh, uh, conclusion on these things. Uh, every time they know when it happened, they assume that, that it's wrong, okay? That's the wrong answer. <laughs> they don't just assume that. They know it's the wrong answer. Uh, but they assume every time they don't know when it happened that it's the correct answer, okay? And so, you know, when they know, they just kind of throw it out and say that, you know, something must be an anomaly or something like that. But every time they don't know, they assume they're, the, the dates are, are correct. And so uh, no way to deal with these anomalies other than just kind of laugh at it. Um, let's see. 
Oh, remember Mount St. Helens? It happened in 1986 or whatever. Well, actually, it happened earlier, but uh, there was a flow from a volcano in 1986 uh, at Mount St. Helens, and they dated that one. It came out to be about 50,000 years old for that flow, but yet it happened in 1986. And uh, some interesting anomalies in the Grand Canyon. You remember seeing this picture uh, or something similar uh, last uh, week. Uh, you've got these layers, which are supposed to be the lower the layer, the older it's supposed to be. Well, they've dated all these layers down here. And it turns out that this layer on top dates to, with using this rubidium strontium method, to about 1.3, no, 1,340 million years or uh, almost a, yeah, well, I don't know, there's no point there, so that's 1,340 million. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, uh, I'll take it for what it means because I got this chart out of a book. Now, yet, this other one down here, this layer right here, which is way lower and should be considerably older, dates to, uh, using the same method, younger, okay? One, a difference of about 300 and some odd million years uh, difference between those two, and so, uh, Again, anomalies, uh, and this stuff is supposed to be extremely accurate, and yet you've got unexplained anomalies. Now, uh, it, it's really not fair for us to just simply be critical of those dating methods and not come up with an alternative solution for how the Earth could be young and yet have all this uh, uh, kind of decay rates going on. So. Before we get into uh, explaining a, just a little bit about what we know uh, now, um, instead of just being critical, coming up with a, a solution to this thing, um, this is a decay chart for the uranium-238 to lead-206 cycle right here. Now, this is, this is how it goes. It starts out as uranium. The, next, the first decay cycle goes to thorium and then proactinium, another, another uh, weight of uranium, another thorium, another radium, radon, polonium. By the way, the polonium has a half-life of three minutes, so it doesn't hang around very long. And then it goes to lead-214, bismuth-214, but these are all radioactive here, all the way down, to lead-210, to bismuth-210, and finally, well, I don't know why my chart uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't fit all the way, but uh, it goes down below there and ends up with lead, okay? Uh, lead-206. And what happens with the lead 206? That's the first one that's stable, okay? That no longer has, that's no longer radioactive. All these are radioactive. And so this is the uh, decay process for uh, uranium dating. And, and you can see these real long half lives. I mean, to go that first step, it takes four and a half uh, to times 10 to the ninth or whatever that trillion years, billion years or whatever uh, to do that. So, um, but what I want you to notice is these are the particles that are emitted. This is the type of decay that it goes from uranium to thorium. That's an alpha particle, the A for alpha. And then go from thorium to proactinium is a beta decay. Beta, and then an alpha, another alpha, another alpha, another alpha. So every time it throws off an alpha particle, that's the <coughs> nucleus of a helium atom. And it turns out that this entire chart has eight alpha particles that are emitted, and that's going to come in to be very important for some, uh, some interesting new studies that have been done. Eight alpha particles are emitted, which are the nuclei of the helium atoms right here. Um, now, about 10 years ago, is that right? Yeah, 10 years ago, uh, there was a group of scientists that formed uh, these seven different scientists who were all creation uh, believes in creation, took upon themselves an eight-year study, okay, and they completed it back in November of 2005. And what they were studying was this RATE project, it stands for Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth, R-A-T-E. And they were, you know, kind of taking a risk because, uh, you know, they didn't know what they were going to find. I mean, maybe maybe they found something that really it, it is that old, you know, because all, all this uh, science stuff uh, can challenge your faith. And so they embarked upon this, assuming that if the Bible's true, then we're going to find some interesting information out there. So that was their worldview. Turns out that there are, the, the way uranium, the, most of the uranium that, that's dated is in granite rock. And if you look at a piece of granite, you're going to find zircon crystals. You've heard of the cubic zirconium, the, the, the fake diamond and so forth. Well, that's kind of the same stuff, but this is a zircon crystal that you find in little tiny ones. I mean, just almost microscopic, but uh, very tiny. 
zircon crystals. And uh, you'll find them in these granites and they extract them from a borehole. They, they will bore a hole deep down to, to, you know, a mile or so deep and they'll pull out these uh, boreholes, these extracted boreholes of, of, of so forth. And they know that this is basement rock. This is rock that cooled from the early magma and cooled into the granites and so forth. And these zircon crystals will have captured uranium and thorium, uh, which are radioactive during that formation. And what they find inside these, now this is these seven scientists studying this stuff, uh, what they found inside these zircon crystals uh, was lots of helium and some lead, okay? And the lead is the daughter product of the uranium uh, to lead decay uh, method. And, uh, but they found lots of helium. And remember I told you that, that we emitted eight particles, eight heli alpha particles, which are helium particles. And so uh, the helium, uh, the, the lots of helium indicates there's been lots of decay in this zircon crystal in the past. And that's the bad news, okay? There has been a lot of radioactive decay. The existence of all that lead and so forth, I mean, you, you just can't get around that if all their assumptions are correct, it is billions of years, you know, th th that old, okay? It's very old. But they said, well, okay, now why is this helium in here? Because a helium is the second smallest atom in our, hydrogen is the only one that's any smaller. And so it's very tiny, okay? And it doesn't react with any other chemicals. Remember I told you it was a noble gas. It has no reaction with any other chemicals. And so in that sense, it's very slippery. In other words, if it's trying to wiggle its way out of something, nothing's going to grab hold of it chemically and say, hey, I want to keep you or whatever. So the helium is completely free to wiggle its way out because it's so small and because it's so slippery. And they're saying, why should there, because, and they also use helium to, to detect leaks, okay? I mean, when you fill up a helium balloon and you tie it tight and everything, what happens to that helium balloon after a couple of days? It, it, it goes down. Well, what happened to the helium in there? It didn't leak out of where you tied it. It leaks out of the material itself. So helium can squeeze its way out of almost anything, including uh, zircon crystals like that. And so they're saying, well, if this zircon crystal has been here for billions of years, there shouldn't be any helium left. It should have all leaked out by now. Okay, so why is there helium in there? And so they, they said, well, let's measure the diffusion rate of helium. So they did some experiments and they discovered that it should be almost all gone after the end of uh, one and a half billion years. And yet there it is still there. So the helium diffusion becomes another clock. And so they did some studies on, on based upon what they measured. Remember, any kind of rate of decay, helium, helium diffusion and so forth is, is a type of decay can be used as a clock if you know the initial amounts and you know uh, uh, the end amounts and the rate of change. And so they know the rate of change now and they know the ending amounts and so uh, they can actually use it as a clock. And the helium diffusion, the amount of helium that's left, considering the helium diffusion, is consistent with an age of the Earth of 6,000 years, believe it or not. I mean, it comes out just perfect for them. And so they say, man, that is great news. But there's bad news too. It means that there's been a lot of decay. What does that mean? The only way they can come up with an explanation is that there must have been some sort of extremely accelerated decay in the past, okay, because of all the lead and all the, the helium that's in there that hadn't had a chance to decay out. It must have been an accelerated decay rate in the past. And so they say God must have greatly accelerated decay either during the flood or, or some during creation or some for some reason. Certainly God's got control over that. We can't explain it physically except that, that God must have changed the uh, uh, the rate of decay for, for whatever reason in the past. And uh, I mean, you can even imagine the reasons. I mean, not that God needs help or anything, but it's if you heat something up and, and nuclear decay is just like putting something on an oven. I mean, it heats it up, the rock will get real hot and melt and all that kind of stuff. Maybe it's easier to move the continents around where you want them <laughs> if you heat them up. I don't know, God doesn't need that help, but that, that's just kind of a thought. Uh, now, and, and there's even more evidence for this accelerated decay rate. It turns out that there are these little, when an alpha particle decays out of a, uh, an atom, remember I said it's so heavy, it's an alpha particle is big, uh, I mean, compared to an electron, I should say, it's not big compared to other atoms, but it, it, it's big compared to an electron as far as radioactive decay. When it decays, it's kind of like an explosion, okay? The alpha particle goes flying out and it hits other parts of the rock that it's embedded in and so forth, and it causes a little halo that you can see under a microscope. 
If you cut that rock in half and you cut through the middle of one of these little uh, 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 halos right there, you can actually see the circle. And you can see rings in this thing. And so the uranium is going to be one type of halo, and you'll see concentric rings because, remember, the uranium goes through multiple cycles. It's got eight different alpha particles, and each one has a different energy level it throws out. And so it gives a pattern for a, a halo that you can see in the same. I wish I, I, I had a picture, but I didn't have time to put it up here. Um, and you've got, remember I told you the, the polonium atom had a very short half-life, like three minutes? Okay, you find those halos in the same rock. But in order for those halos to form in that rock, they had to happen very quickly, okay? And so the existence of very long decay rates plus the existence of very short decay rates all in the same rock indicate that it happened quickly and that the decay rate must have been extremely accelerated. Only way to explain that. So there's more evidence that, uh, that they're owned to something like that. And finally, this is, this is, the, uh, this, this is the great one. We're, we're going to step back to carbon-14. This was the rate group that decided to, to look at carbon-14 one more time, too. They said, you know what? We find carbon-14 in coal. Okay, Coal is supposed to be buried for millions of years underneath the earth. You know, all the pressure to make that plant matter turn into coal so that you can burn it in your, in your houses and cars and all that kind of stuff. Uh, why do we find carbon-14 in there? Well, their only explanation that the scientists can give is that it must have been contaminated in some sort of way because coal is porous and maybe water can pass through it so it can get contaminated and, and all that kind of stuff. So they said, okay, now what kind of carbon is there that can't get contaminated? What else is made out of carbon that's really hard? Diamonds. Okay, now no one's ever thought to measure for carbon-14 inside of a diamond, but they did. They crushed this diamond up, and there's no way a diamond can get contaminated. Guess what they found? Carbon-14, meaning that diamond must have gotten formed if, you know, not considering the flood and so forth, must have gotten formed uh, less than 50,000 years ago because otherwise there wouldn't be any carbon-14 in there. And so, uh, uh, all of these are fantastic evidences that uh, uh, that uh, we're, we're on to a, some, I mean, it's a lot more work to be done on this, but we're on to a, something here that really uh, fits with what the biblical evidence uh, would be. So that's the diamond thing that they discovered. Now, uh, it's 731, I need to finish up here, but let me stop with this scripture right here. Scripture, by the way, predicts all of this, okay? I mean, in, in uh, 2 Peter 3, uh, 3 through 6 says, In the last days, mockers will come, saying, All continues just as it was from the beginning. They are willy, willingly ignorant of this, that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. And so the key phrases there, this is their uniformitarian assumption right there. They think that everything's been continuing just as it was. They don't consider what? The flood right there. And so this is saying they're willingly ignorant of this fact that it was formed out of water and flooded with water. And uh, this is a mistake in their assumption and the Bible even predicts that right there. So who are you gonna trust? You're gonna trust God or are you gonna trust man? It says it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in a man. Psalm 118. Eight. Let me pray. Father in heaven, uh, our starting point is the Word of God and our finishing point is the Word of God, but we're just subduing the earth and studying your creation, Father, to examine uh, the tax on, uh, on our faith, Rob. And so give us wisdom. You're the creator of the universe. You know everything, Father. So uh, help us out. And, and uh, you never make mistakes. You never tell lies. And so, Father, you're gracious to answer our prayers, and so we ask you for that now. For this help. We thank you for helping us to confirm your word, and we trust that we can trust you in your creation story. And we ask you to go with us now to our homes. In Jesus' name, amen.